We talked about the Russian avant-garde in terms of 1915 Malevich suprematism, Goncharova, Cubo futurism, and Tatlin's corner counter reliefs. But we have to think about it afresh in terms of the concept of art into life, because there's a dramatic resurgence and redirection of Russian avant-gardeism after 1917. In October of 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution overthrew Russia's Tsar, its hereditary ruler. This is a photograph of the Red Army storming the Winter Palace, storming the palace of essentially the king. Now, this is a dramatic and exciting event. One writer at the time called it 10 days that shook the world. The idea that the working class people would seize the palace, throw out the ruler, and take hold of the mechanics of running the country, the politics. It was actually a terrible time, though, to stage a working class revolution. World War I had already been grinding on for three years. Miraculously, they seize the Winter Palace, but this is not the victorious end point. It is actually the beginning of an ongoing struggle. Russia would be in a civil war for years. In an attempt to extinguish working class revolution from becoming a global phenomenon, capitalist countries of Western Europe bankrolled counter-revolutionary fighters. By the time the Red Army finally won the struggle, after years of civil war in Russia, the ideals of working class self-determination were already being compromised since Lenin had attained a level of prominence as a leader that went against the notion of collectivism. But in terms of art, this is an incredibly momentous event. And how will it be commemorated? How will it be changed? The most dramatic and immediate response to this event is by Tatlin, and it is called the Monument to the Third International. It's a model because this wonderful, incredible design never gets realized. Tatlin receives the commission, as explained in the textbook, to commemorate what's called the Third International, which was the third international meeting of the Communist Party. And this is going to be a building that will house the umbrella organization, the International, devoted to the worldwide spread of communism. So it's going to be a functional building that is for this vision of a working class future. And the textbook does a nice job of kind of walking you through some significant features. We're looking at the model and we see the steel structural support as a pair of leaning spirals connected by grill work. And this is on the outside rather than the inside of the building. So the architectural bones, the structural system is exposed. Let's make the implications of this explicit. Important thing to do when you're writing your papers. The implication is that this is a, a actual little microcosm of revolution. And this is, as a microcosm of revolution, it is going to be a, a construction where you can see the structure, unlike Tatlin would say, bourgeois society, where the actual structures of power are hidden from view. Here it is fully on display. So the amazing thing is this, this tower that looks like the Eiffel Tower matched with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which is a dynamic spiraling form and it's tilting form because the tilting form is a dynamic form. This is supposed to express dynamism, but it's also supposed to make it literally possible because it's actually going to house four separate spaces and they're going to be different geometric shapes. You get a cube housing conferences and Congress meetings, a pyramid for executive committees, a cylinder for the propaganda or they might say media offices, and then a hemisphere at the top for radio equipment these core geometric units, and they're each for the work of creating this workers' collective. So places of meaning. Now these were actually supposed to be, I don't think they mentioned this, these were supposed to be transparent glass chambers so that you can see what's going on inside. 
just imagine for a minute if our houses of government were not marble enclosures, but actually were were you know cubes of glass that you can look into and see what's going on there. The idea is that you know this revolution is supposed to be a collective struggle. It winds up being not that <laughs> under Lenin, but that's another topic. A collective struggle where there are meanings gatherings, Congress making decisions together. And this is all going to be made clear and visible and transparent in the form of the building where all this will take place. And so the most amazing thing is that these spaces were going to rotate. These would be rotating chambers and they would rotate at different temporalities according to the year, the month, the day, the hour, so that you have a sense of revolution as movement, as the act of turning and dynamically spiraling toward ever more perfect vision of what a society could be. This was very wittily discussed at the time as being the first monument without a beard. I love that line. So it's a monument without a beard. It's supposed to be a monument <clears throat> to the Third International, to what is being achieved Inter, from their view as an international working class struggle, but it's not a monument with a beard, meaning it's not a statue of some guy with a beard. That's the critical idea as history up until now has been told as the history of what is called great man history. The notion that some great man, and almost very rarely is a woman allowed to be in that category, a great man is leading history. This view of history is contested by historians now, but at, by these revolutionaries, the idea is no, the, the great man is not leading history, but the people are leading history. The irony is that there are so many monuments to Lenin, a man with a beard, monuments that propose him as the great man of history, because in fact, the revolution had already sort of lost its grounding in collective action, did not know how to organize that on that scale under those conditions. And very soon we would see Lenin as the leader purporting to save the revolution and then Stalin doing the same. Where are you, Stalin? I saw you on this page there. When in fact, they're of course corrupting the revolution and bringing it down into um, violent, authoritarian, totalitarian dictatorship and completely betraying what the revolution was going to be. But at the time, no one saw that, knew that was coming. And Tatlin, with his monument to the Third International, seemed to be proposing that there would be an altogether new way of approaching the task of making. So the Russian avant-garde in the 20s would think of itself as doing constructivism not making art. And El Lizitsky makes this brilliant photo montage of, him, of himself as the constructor, where we have his photograph face superimposed with his hand connecting with his eye, mind and hand working together with the compass and the X, Y, Z, the end point of the logic of revolution, the circle with the graph paper. The idea is that constructing a new world a worker's world is the job that artists in Russia see themselves doing. And Rachenko is one of the standouts building his workers club of 1925, an actual space to promote the gathering and the learning of the worker in this process of continuous revolution.